So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marco Mazia. I'm executive coordinator of the Initiative for Science in Europe. If you like acronyms, IEC. So for those of you who don't know us yet, IEC is an umbrella organization gathering together European learning societies and research organizations. So our members are from many different disciplines and across different ages. Uh, as such, we are representing in the, uh, many researchers' communities and uh, throughout different, uh, um, different career stages. So among many aspects ISC is interested on in policy in general and in the structure of research in Europe, one thing that we have been following for, for a long time is about how to improve the mechanism for policy advice to policymakers, science advice to policymakers. And um, in that context, we have organized in the past a workshop on this. And, and recently, we have um, deeply surveyed our members to understand their experiences with science advice. Uh, apart from the fact that different disciplines uh, have developed different ways of advising policymakers, and also they might have um, different kind of relationships with uh, policymakers. In, in general, what came up is that many times it's not clear how uh, researchers can engage with policymakers. And this is the main uh, objective uh, of, this, uh, of this webinar today. And so the webinar will be moderated by Hannah Jones, who's a biologist by training. And she's been working on this topic as an intern of ISC for a few months now. So she's our expert. And uh, before closing my introduction, I would, I would just like to thank the panelists for their availability to contribute and all attendees for their interests. Enjoy, Hannah, the floor is yours. Brilliant, thanks a lot, Marco. Um, so yeah, thank you for that introduction and for kicking off the session. Um, and also thanks for the opportunity to put together um, this, this webinar and have uh, such great panel speakers to discuss more on, on what's clearly a really important and pertinent topic at the moment. So um, won't keep you for too long. Um, so as Marco mentioned, uh, for my introduction, I won't keep you too long. You can stay for the full, full webinar. Um, as Marco mentioned, uh, the aim for the webinar today is to look at the pathways for research communities to engage with science advising. Um, so we hope to, to make it more understandable the, the different opportunities that are available and also to think about um, how research communities can in increase the contribution and impact that research can make um, in a policy making space. So throughout the session we hope we'll, we'll touch on some practical ways to build relationships with policymakers, um, con uh, consider the different stakeholders that might contribute to the process um, and expand a bit on the value and importance of science advising in different contexts. So we've got a really great panel today that um, I'll hand over to um, very shortly to give some opening thoughts on the topic. Um, and also we've got a Q&A &A to follow that, um, that initial discussion. So we, we really welcome you to submit any questions or discussion points that you'd like to add to the conversation in the, in the Q&A function that you should be able to find at the bottom of your, of your screen. Um, and we'll get through as many of those as possible and then wrap up the session um, in just under an hour's time. So without further delay, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce our expert speakers for today. So they'll be sharing their, their insights on the topic of science advising. So we have Sarian Bowers, who is the head of policy at the Wellcome Sanger Institute in Cambridge. We have Alice Chapman Hatchett, president of European Public Health Alliance and the director of the Health in Europe Centre. We have Thomas Sandewski, director and science policy dialogue projects at Goethe University in Frankfurt. Um, and Lena Top, project officer for the knowledge management for policy training and network in the European Commission Joint Research Centre. So thank you very much to all our panelists for being here today and for your time. Um, I'm sure I'm not alone in really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have. So. Um, yeah, if I could um, come to Sarian first and maybe ask you to give a little bit of an introduction to your own background, um, your experience in engaging researchers and policymakers in the context of 
science advising. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hannah, and thank you for inviting me to this event. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say today. Um, so as Hannah mentioned, I am Head of Policy at the Wellcome Sanger Institute. Uh, we are a genomics institute just outside of Cambridge. Uh, we were founded as um, this, we were kind of the largest contributor to the Human Genome Project, um, and we were founded on that basis. And since then, we have gone on to have um, five programs looking at a very wide range of genomics that is um, with the kind of mission to improve human health. Um, and a few years ago, there was this, I think there was this sort of understanding at Sanger that in order to really uh, deliver that ability to impact human health and improve the world around us, there is this sort of need for things like a policy function. And so I started at Sanger six years ago and I was brought in as a relatively junior policy person with no one else around. And I have since built um, a small team around me doing policy. And I think um, Hannah made a really interesting point about science advice. I would say that we, in my policy team and myself, we don't do a huge amount of science advice. We would do science advocacy. And so that really means for us that we go out and we tell politicians about why our science is important and not just politicians, I should say policymakers. Um, so a large part of my work actually isn't about our science so much. It's about the impact of policy on our science. So we have done a lot of work on GDPR, for example, and we played a very important part in um, the UK's interpretation of GDPR. Uh, we're currently involved in the European Commission's joint action for the um, creation of the European health data space, again, because of our experience with, with handling data. We're one of the largest data producers in Europe. Um, and similarly, we work on things like the Nagoya Protocol, which is about access and benefit sharing in low middle income countries um, and um, some of the proposals around that. So with that, that's engagement with the UN as opposed to maybe with European or with national level government. Um, at the same time, we do have science advice and science advisors. Um, our science has increasingly become, as genomics has kind of matured into this, this field that is increasingly impacting science, government wants, you know, they want advice on genomics. Um, I think COVID has really crystallised that in many ways. So Sanger um, very rapidly pivoted at the beginning of the pandemic um, to do sequencing of the COVID genomes. And we've been... The, without wanting to blow my trumpet too much, but we have been the largest producer of COVID genomes in the world. So we've actually produced about 25% of all of the genomes that have been made available in the world in one, just on this site. And, and the UK has been pretty transformative on that. But it has meant that the government, you know, we've created this template for how you can handle infectious disease in future, whether that's the pandemic scale or in the microenvironment of hospitals, it's kind of the same principles. Um, and so government, you know, governments are from, you know, not just the UK government, but world governments as well are quite interested in this. So we're now seeing quite an uptick of engagement. So our, our faculty are now going out and talking to organisations like the World Health Organisation. They're working with public health agencies. They're advising our government. Um, and so I think, you know, myself and other colleagues have spent a long time raising the profile of Sanger and then this moment has come along where our science has matured, we were already visible to government and, um, and so now we're able to provide advice. Um, and I think hopefully we'll see, you know, the, the impact of our science being felt by government and felt by improving health for society. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Um, Brilliant, thanks, Darian. Um, all so many interesting angles to come, come to later in the discussion, I'm sure, but. Yeah, really interesting to think about how science advising isn't always in an isolated context and it, it feeds around and, and things will impact back onto, onto science from a policy angle yep. as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think uh, next, I think I'm on my list, I'm gonna come to Alice, if that's okay, and, and hand the floor to you to give your, your background and, and initial thoughts. That's all right, thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm wearing two hats this afternoon. Um, the first is as the president of the European Public Health Alliance, 
which is an alliance of 80 civil society organisations, all interested in public health, um, coming at it from very different perspectives. So from homeless uh, organisations representing the homeless, other vulnerable groups, disease specific organisations, health workforce, everyone with an interest in ultimately uh, advocating for improved public health. And it's interesting, Sarian, that you put forward that word first, so I'm going to refer to that to advocacy is very much uh, what we do. Um, and we represent the citizens voice in the debate uh, around public health. And we represent that upwards uh, towards by and large the Commission, European Commission, but not only um, working also with other uh, strategic partners, uh, for example, WHO, um, all, all about how can we actually uh, uh, breed, create uh, a better environment for everybody. Um, when we talk about public health, I think that sounds quite abstract sometimes. It's people's health at the end of the day. Uh, we're all people, we are all the public, um, and and EFA is about improving our, 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 our health. So that's, that's the one side. The other hat that I'm wearing is the director of the Health and Europe Centre, which is a not-for-profit organisation in the UK. Um, which similarly um, is in, aimed at improving, and we're more specific here, patient outcomes. Um, a lot of that is via uh, European funded research projects. Um, we're currently managing a portfolio of 67 million euro of projects covering multiple countries and a huge range of topics. So anything from type two diabetes to dementia, to uh, um, uh, intelligent wheelchairs, everything and anything, that that covers uh, improved patient outcomes will will get involved and we work very much on behalf of the national health service in the uk in terms of doing that having said all of that i'm a linguist by background um, so i'm coming to science very much from a humanities perspective um, and i think that leads quite nicely on to sort of a few thoughts around science advising and I'd like to start uh, with a quote uh, by Umberto Eco, who said, the most evident explanations of many worrying facts don't satisfy us, often because it hurts us to accept them. And he was speaking uh, uh, in terms of conspiracy theories uh, quite specifically, but I actually think that quite nicely encapsulates the issue between science and uh, citizens and policy, um, because science is objective, whereas we as humans aren't. Um, and uh, um, I think four key words that I'd like to pull out are people, values, trust, and science. And if you think about those, three of them are linked to sort of quite emotional aspects. So I put my people and my values and my trust in the emotional basket. And then two are linked to rational things. One is science, obviously, but the other is also people. We can be both rational and emotional. And I think this connector is really the joining of the dots between the people and the policy. Um, when you get involved in European uh, uh, funded uh, science research, there is that great big box that says citizen science. And it's there for a reason. At the end of the day, we are all people. And I think quite often when scientists are trying to make their case towards policymakers and trying to advocate for change, their answer tends to be more science. And ultimately that doesn't cut through. If you're not a scientist by background, just having more numbers, more data thrown at you isn't going to convince you. What needs to convince you is a human, an emotional argument. And so my answer to that would be, scientists, I'm sorry you've got it wrong. We need less science and more human aspects. How would you talk about your research to your grandmother, your grandfather, your niece or your nephew, you know, somebody who actually doesn't understand the science at all. If you can create a human contact, then of course people are going to start listening to you and that's when you'll get the policymakers' ears. Um, so I think um, I, I'll just sort of end, Hannah, by saying that the role of the citizen, the patient, the person 
is absolutely central to researchers being able to successfully engage with policymakers. And I think it is, it's about building trust and creating a values-based connection between all three groups. Fantastic. Thank you for those thoughts, Alice. That's really interesting. And um, thinking about the, the connection of the, the human connection and maybe in the context of um, it bringing some challenges and also massive benefits to the, the, the making the process of science advising effective and achieving those outcomes that are also linking you and Sarian with trying to improve, um, you know, society, health, um, current situations, definitely. Thank you. Um, too premature with my muting there, sorry. I'm gonna jump on to uh, Thomas to uh, hand over for, for your introduction, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see the presentation? Yes. All right. Great. So I'm going to elaborate uh, on uh, what uh, Alice said on the uh, science-human uh, interaction, and uh, I'm happy to elaborate on a uh, program uh, which is uh, run uh, by the universities in Frankfurt, Darmstadt, and, and Mainz, which is the Mercator Science Policy Fellowship uh, program. And the aim of the program is to foster dialogue between scientists and uh, policy professionals. So. Um, what exactly, uh, and uh, we are targeting uh, senior policy professionals who are usually heads, heads of units in uh, ministries, uh, national agencies, but also in the European Commission, international organizations, uh, NGOs, and media. Um, the, our program is funded by the uh, MacArthur Foundation, and I would also like to add, uh, we haven't invented this type of uh, uh, program. Uh, we modeled it after the programs at the Center for Science at, uh, and Policy at Cambridge University. So uh, what exactly uh, are we doing? Uh, we are um, distributing uh, calls for applications each year and we ask uh, policy professionals uh, to apply. And when they apply, they can provide a list of topics or questions they are interested in. And we are very open in this regard. So um, every topic from A like our architecture to, to Zilex zoology uh, can be addressed. And we then conduct um, uh, a matching between the interests of our uh, policy professionals or policy fellows and the expertise uh, of our scientists and we then organize face-to-face uh, -face meetings and um, usually our uh, pol uh, policy fellows they visit us twice a year and uh, they conduct a total of, of about 16 face-to-face -face meetings with our uh, researchers so what questions do the fellows ask um, we, we can say that um, about 40% of our fellows ask uh, quite specific questions like, um, does the use of learning software in primary schools improve learning uh, performance? Um, many ask uh, basic questions like, uh, how innovative are companies in the European Union? Or how can energy consumption be reduced in OECD countries? And also uh, many fellows take the opportunity to get an overview on uh, topics they are not familiar with, like how do algorithms work or how are vaccines developed and produced? Um, so you see we're we are quite open when it comes to the questions the policy professionals can ask. What is the record of our program? Um, we accepted uh, 157 um, fellows into our programs, program and they've conducted more than 1,900 face-to-face meetings with uh, 620 researchers over the past uh, five years. So it's, it's a pretty large scale uh, program. And what are the lessons learned or what are my, my recommendations? And I, I understand that, that many of the viewers are, are early career researchers. So um, the first lesson is, and again, this is about the, the, the science uh, human uh, interaction, uh, to talk to policy professionals whenever you can. Uh, and face-to-face uh, -face meetings or personal meetings and even Zoom meetings are actually a very effective uh, way of, of uh, transferring uh, knowledge into the policy se sector. Also meetings are very, uh, time efficient. And uh, if you leave a good impression, uh, they are often also a first step for establishing long-term uh, networks. Um, also, the way we are running our program, uh, it allows for um, confronting our policy fellows with uh, multidisciplinary approaches. Let's say someone is interested in the issue of how en energy consumption can be reduced so we can uh, organize face-to-face uh, -face meetings with experts uh, from architecture, engineering, but also economists who are working on, on uh, energy taxes, uh, political scientists who are working on uh, uh, environmental law, etc. So it's, it's a great way to get in touch uh, with many academic disciplines uh, in a couple of days. And uh, 
we also say uh, that the face-to-face -face meetings are also a great uh, communication tool because uh, they um, these are informal settings. So these are not uh, official hearings in parliaments or consultations in ministries or media interviews uh, where uh, researchers uh, have to think what they are uh, saying. So um, the uh, environment is, is a quite open one. And uh, we also stress that uh, science advice is not a one-way street. Uh, researchers also learn a quite a lot by, by, by talking to, to policy professionals. And we are regularly conducting surveys uh, on this issue. And about 60% of our researchers tell us that they actually derive ideas for their own research projects by talking to, to policymakers. And uh, finally, um, talk is not cheap. Uh, we have two full-time positions who are running this program. And uh, we, we, we are happy to encourage uh, other universities uh, to run similar pro uh, uh, programs and to provide the resources uh, to do so. Um, just uh, some recommendations for, for early career researchers. If you're wondering how to get started, uh, I can recommend getting familiar with a policy debate. So um, check the websites or reports uh, by ministries, by the European Commission, international organizations, and other organizations. Um, get, get familiar with policy structures. So this is uh, ask yourself who is in charge of what, and uh, it takes some time uh, to understand how, how politics work. And so, uh, a pretty good uh, idea is to check organization charts and um, it's also a good approach when you think who would you like to, to, to reach and when you look at an organization chart, chart uh, you can already identify the policy officers or heads of units who are in charge uh, of the issues you are interested in. Uh, think about your target group, um, so do you want to reach uh, policy professionals in ministries, uh, would you like to reach uh, uh, MPs or um, uh, activists and NGOs? Um, also think about uh, gatekeepers. So um, many uh, MP, uh, members of parliament or um, heads of units, they have assistants, they, they have also policy uh, officers uh, who are in charge of filtering information and uh, channeling information. So um, don't be uh, disappointed if you can't get, a, uh, can't get a meeting with a minister, uh, if you have uh, the chance to talk uh, to his or her uh, assistant for 30 minutes, um, that's also um, a great success. And uh, last um, suggestion, uh, don't get frustrated. Um, so uh, science uh, advice is a long-term process. Um, it, it takes time to, to, to change politics and it, it might not, uh, there might be uh, no impact at all. So um, don't get frustrated if, if, if you talk to a minister and, and he's not going to change the law in the next date. All right, thank you. Wonderful. I, I'm absolutely sure that's very true, that final point. Um, that was great. Thank you. Really good to hear um, the lessons learned from, from that, from the Mercator Fellowships Programme and to think about the directions that people can start thinking in. And maybe it also links a little bit back to what Alice was saying of um, thinking about the way that um, people generating research engage with policymakers and, and the skills needed and how that dialogue can be improved. Wonderful. So last but by no means least, I'm, I'm gonna come to Lena to finish off her with, the, with her introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And, and thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to take part here. Um, I have a few, uh, I mean, um, my name is Lena, as I said, and I'm working at the, the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. And the Joint Research Center is the knowledge service of the European Commission. We have around 2000 scientists and our role is to provide uh, science for, to, for the European policies that are being developed or assessed uh, and so on. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm a political scientist uh, and in my current job, I'm kind of uh, mixing what I, what I have learned about impact and policy impact and, and training, learning and development. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is these 10 tips uh, for how to achieve policy impact that we've uh, developed. But first, I just wanted to set the context, uh, although some of it has already been said, I think we can gather from the other presentations that connecting science and policymaking is not always easy. Um, policymakers may not have the time or the right skills to engage with science. And there are other sources of information, uh, other political pressures, biases that weaken the inclination towards certain knowledge and other factors that interfere with the uptake of, of science and policymaking. And on the science side, um, well, 
we may not deliver the findings in time or the research is not directly useful uh, or relevant uh, to the policy at hand. Um, so, but still, I mean, connecting uh, science to policymaking is always important and is always beneficial, as Thomas just said. So what can scientists do? I mean, you can send a paper to the cabinet of a commissioner or your head of unit or the equivalent in the member state. But uh, as I've alluded to, it might be a little bit more complicated than that. And that's why we, we've tried to, we've developed these 10 tips. Um, it's, it's a very short publication, four pages, um, uh, that I would recommend you to look uh, through uh, afterwards. What I will do here now is just that I will go through just a few of them. It's not that they are more important than others. It's just um, we, we don't have the time in this uh, quick introduction to go through all of them. From our point of view, they are, they are equally important. But if you look up in the, in the top left corner, so start by, as a scientist, if you want to achieve impact, uh, policy impact, start by understand policy making first. You know, understand the actors, the processes, and the operational logic in policy making. And then you've, you can see that it differs from that in, in science. I mean, ask yourself, what are the policy goals? What are the decisions or how are the decisions made? Who are the key actors? You know, follow parliamentary debates, discussions on Twitter, and participate in policy relevant uh, events. Um, this will really help you to anticipate who may actually need your evidence and when they may need it so, so it becomes timely. Um, the second one I wanted to look into is, is the one on the policy impact as a team sport. So all still on the left hand side, but towards the bottom. Um, we, I mean, nobody's superhuman, at least uh, to, my dollar, to my knowledge. I mean, you can't do everything, you cannot know everything and you cannot know everyone. Um, so by improve, or improving the use of scientific evidence in, in a conscious and systematic manner, is not an individual task, but a collective effort. Also, as we just heard uh, Thomas saying, so this includes policymakers who demand the evidence, but also colleagues, networks, and organizations in research that supply the evidence. Um, and you may not always be the one meeting the policymakers. So think about if your colleagues know the policy implications of your work, uh, because they may be the ones uh, that actually meet uh, the policymakers, and hence they can be the ambassadors uh, for, for your evidence and, and uh, likewise in, in the other direction. Um, the other one I wanted to, to mention here is the one about becoming bilingual in both science and policy. Um, communicating to policymakers requires different approaches than to scientists. Um, it requires being able to tell a captivating story, of course, that you can back up with facts. Um, and the captivating story is, is very often more convincing than yet more facts, as we also heard uh, from, from Alice before. So we know that the aim of science is to know, and the task of policy is to solve problems. So there's also different norms, different cultures, different languages, and different uh, timeframes. And therefore, when engaging with policymakers, we do need to adapt our language and our communication practices to this time pressed uh, audience. So that means that we need to use shorter and simpler formats, avoid jargon and, and technical details and use narratives and, and visualizations. Um, so actually in a way we're saying, take the opposite approach to scientific papers, start with the conclusions and leave background and methodologies for later. And think also of, of new channels. Uh, policymakers rarely read academic papers, sometimes because they're behind uh, paywalls, but they follow blogs, they follow Twitter, they listen to podcasts. So think also about getting your science out uh, in the media that policymakers are, are following. Um, but still, of course, remember that they do seek robust and easily digestible scientific evidence. Um, and the last of the 10 tips that I wanted to touch upon today was just 
uh, to continue also on what uh, Alice said that maybe here we call it beware of a single study that it's maybe not more evidence that is needed but it maybe is joined up evidence so instead of you as a scientist um doing a very kind of uh, uh how to say narrow uh, because a specialized analysis maybe what the policymakers often need is an analysis that synthesizes and and looking at it from the policy problem uh, uh, point of view so in this sense the policymakers may actually prefer a concise across disciplinary synthesis of the existing knowledge base instead of a new, another new piece uh, of research. Um, so seen from a policymaker point of view, scientific novelty is not always a virtue. Uh, put your research in the context of the wider knowledge and prioritize research synthesis and literature review. Um, and also have in mind that relevant findings from a decade ago may bring more impact if they are still relevant uh, if they're still valid and relevant to the current problem than yet uh, another new study. Um, so, so to conclude, I mean, policymaking is complex and it is messy uh, and, and scientific evidence is only one part of the equation. Um, science cannot resolve the values dilemmas or decide how to make the necessary trade-offs between different interests. That's for the politicians. As for excellent science, uh, policy impact takes time. I think Doma also mentioned that, and sometimes you will not see, you will not see the policy impact, especially not in the way that you see citations, and it, you may not see it even if it does exist. And if you do uh, succeed, policymakers may take the credit for that. For to our JSC researchers, what what we do say is that just accept that. Try your best and, and, and learn for the next time on how, how to, to improve the, the uptake of your evidence by policymakers. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Really practical and um, yeah, useful ways to, to frame the, the different methods that people need to be engaging with and, and some of the challenges there. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> brilliant. Really enjoyed hearing those um, those initial overviews and so many questions that I'm sure um, we'll uh, we'll get onto. Um, I, I'll just do a quick reminder to say Q and A box is open for um, anyone to to add any thoughts or questions that you might have for the panelists, um, and I will be keeping a close eye on that and adding any in that that I can can see coming through. So. Um, I might just start with with one question. Um, really interesting to be thinking about um, how you can work as an individual scientist, um, which I know that um, Toma and Lena have, have touched on a lot, um, and Alice as well, thinking about the relationships that you're building and the, the importance of, of proper, um, um, proper ways of engaging between the people involved. Um, and Sari and you were coming from um, also a perspective of having a bigger organization and representing a, a, a bigger body of work. And there are different pathways that people can be aware of engaging with. Um, and I wonder in your fields, um, what your experiences of how receptive people are to, to different people getting involved in policymaking from different levels, um, how receptive policymakers are to these conversations, but also how receptive maybe researchers are to getting involved with these conversations. Um, maybe if I come to Alice first on that one, if that's all right. Yes, certainly. Um, I think uh, I'll, I'll pick up on what Lena said uh, in her slides. Uh, your number seven point, Lena, I absolutely loved, become bilingual in science and policy. And I think that's absolutely the key. We speak two different languages. Once, and speaking as a linguist, speaking as a, a, an interpreter was my original training. Once you have made the connection with a person in a format that they can understand, then of course the dialogue is open. So I think it's absolutely key to establishing that contact um, in, in terms of speaking in a language that the other side can understand. Then of course people want to listen because of course policymakers want to do something that is going to improve whatever 
aspect of policy they're working on and they need it to be evidence-based i mean whatever part of the scientific community you come from everything that we do as policymakers is backed up by evidence you can't just start policy just like this it has to have a solid grounding in the evidence but again picking up on on what lena said again from a policymaker's perspective, it's upside down. So whereas as a, a scientist, you'll start from your facts, these are your facts and you'll build up from there. Policymakers don't wanna know about that. They want to hear the story. How is this going to change something? Ah, it's gonna change it, show me how. And so that's when as a scientist, you bring out your methodology, all your protocols, your results, whatever it is you've done. But first, you've got to tell a, a really, really compelling story. And if you can't tell the story, you might as well not bother engaging because we are on to it's it's like that that famous book that was kicking around when I was growing up. Uh, uh, Men are from Mar Mars and women are from Venus or the other way around. I can't remember which one it was now, but we are we're standing on two completely different icebergs here. Um, and until you can bridge the gap and, and make a connection, you won't get comprehension because a policymaker won't understand the science and the scientist won't necessarily understand the overall impact that the policymaker is trying to achieve. So it is, it's, it's tell a story. And, and the best, one of the best routes that I've found over the years to tell a story is to use a personal story because we can all relate to that. And if you can say, my science has improved this person's life for whatever reason, then of course, wow, I'm listening to you um, and you've got the connection and the door is opened. Yeah, I can absolutely see that. Um, Lena, do you, do you have anything you want to um, follow up on from, from that at all? I think, and I hope I'm not, uh, I'm not being too provocative. Uh, I think it's also about attitudes. I mean, I, I fully agree with what Alice says that it's about, you know, communication is about the skills and the competences and the understanding of working, uh, how this policymaking works. But it's also about an attitude among scientists and researchers to say it is part of my work. It is part of my work to communicate this not only in peer reviewed articles, but also to a non scientific audience. Uh, so I think. Uh, what we often hear in the DSC is that, okay, and then it's on top of my work. Uh, it's a yet another thing that I have to do. Um, our reply <laughs> then is that, you know, if you have a two year uh, research project, you could probably include four days for communication in there. And our, our argument is that if you include a few days for communication and thinking about how this would work with policymakers or for policymakers, you actually improve by much more than the four days, the uptake of the likelihood of the impact of the policy impact. So it's really about saying that policy impact is part of many research projects, not all, uh, but many it is part of, and that we need to, to, to allocate resources and time for it uh, and accept that that's part of the work. Yeah. That, that yeah totally totally makes sense um maybe um tomo if i uh, come to you next do, do you see uh, this kind of appreciation maybe with the uh, researchers that are engaging with the policy fellows on the Mercator program at all yes um uh, I mean, there, there are several uh, types of appreci appreciation and uh, they, they really appreciate uh, to have uh, access to a policymaker uh, for 60 minutes so that they can talk to them. And uh, this is a quite uh, unique uh, opportunity uh, for most uh, of our researchers. And, uh, but I also have to say what, what, what just, just Alina mentioned, um, when I look at universities, um, the science communication or science transfer uh, is, is also uh, perceived as, as additional work and uh, our um, our uh, structures uh, do not uh, usually uh, value uh, uh, this this type of work so in, in order to become a sex successful researcher uh, you have to publish in, in peer-reviewed uh, journals you have to bring in uh, grant money and uh, what everything else you do is, is, is actually a on top and, and, and thankfully uh, things are changing because also funding uh, agencies are, are uh, emphasizing the issue of uh, 
uh, science communication, uh, but still I, I do understand if, if especially early career researchers are a bit hesitant to, to start uh, engaging uh, with, with policy professionals. And I think it's, it's up to universities and other uh, research institutions to, to provide uh, the structures uh, in order to assist uh, uh, with policy engagement. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I might actually quickly come to Saren on this because um, it's, gosh, traded off a train of thought. Um, I, well, I mean, I would be interested to hear your, your general thoughts on this and if I can immediately draw back my thought, I will come to you again, but sorry. Yeah. No, no, no worries. Uh, yeah, I would, so I think in terms of, you know, how receptive are politicians and policymakers to science? I think in general, they are actually very receptive and they get quite excited by science. I won't name the very high level cabinet minister who missed a photo opportunity with sick children because he was in our sequencing building and got rather enamored with the, um, the sequencing machines. You know, so they, they kind of love science and science is a great news story for politicians as well in many ways because it's cross party, it's not a political thing. And so, but but at the same time, they are not scientists. They aren't in, they're not really down in the weeds of individual projects. And so often it's about finding those very key messages that, you know, what is it that, you know, the, you want the policymaker to take away? And so for me, you know, when I'm engaging with a policymaker, I am cherry picking from some really amazing science, you know, and I'm, I'm quite blessed in that regard and so I you know if I have someone coming from maybe the WHO I will be looking at our work in low income countries I'll be looking at um, our disease surveillance stuff if I have a health minister from the UK government I'll be thinking about what you know what projects have they got going on at the moment what can I show them that maybe is the next the next thing on from what they're doing at the moment so I might talk about some of our rare disease work or you know looking at common genetics uh, gen sorry complex genetics of common disease that kind of thing so but I have to pick my key messages and again as, as I say I've got a portfolio of science to pick from I'm not a researcher with my own narrower view but I think it's that key messaging but you know, I think actually politicians and policymakers, they know the value of science. They know it's a good news story for most countries. It's cross party. So you can generally get, you know, good engagement on a particular issue. They may not want to hear when you're asking for money and they may not want to hear if you're like asking to push about legislation. But, you know, again, it sort of varies. So, yeah. Wonderful. And thank you for managing to cover what I was potentially going to come to um, on the fact that you are working in a solely policy position rather than as a researcher. And you nicely covered there that you're able to pick from the research available and, you know, you've got that focus from your, your own position. Um, I'm going to come to the, the Q&A now because we've had a, a nice question through uh, from Martin, who um, I'm just going to go to a second question first. Um, would like to hear a bit on how you see the difference between science advice and science advocacy. Um, so I might come to Sarian on this first, actually, because you did touch on it a little bit in your in your introduction. I think it's a really good topic. Yeah, so I think um, there is, I mean, there's a really big, there is a difference, quite a strong difference between the two. And actually, there's a guy called Roger Pilker who writes um, about the kind of different forms of science policy. And he actually writes specifically about this issue. So if anybody wants to go away and read it, I thoroughly recommend some of his work so I would call myself an advocate I um, I talk about our science in a fairly general kind of way um, I um, go out and I you know I want I want government to be supporting UK science European science I want um, I want legislation that they're making to be appropriate for science in a way it's lobbying but I would always say that lobbying is has financial interests and is less is more about commercial interests this is much more about public goods and and sort of UK science European science in particular and some global science on the kind of some of the low middle income country stuff that we do Science adv uh, advisory, advisory work, I would always, you know, defer to our scientists on. And so typically, you know, what would have, in fact, what happened, you know, quite recently, our Office of Life Sciences wanted a scientist to provide advice on their genomic strategy. They come to me, not for my advice, because I can't 
my level of you know knowledge about genomics is not sufficient that I can advise them in the detail that they need but I know which scientists to go and find and so those scientists will come and tell them how you know how do you actually do a strategy on genomics and what are the things that a genomic strategy should be should be looking at what is the current state of play on a certain area of genomics so this one was particularly around bringing genomics into the NHS um, and so looking very much at human sequencing as opposed to you know again we've got disease surveillance and things like that so um, I would say that's really the fundamental difference and there um, the scientists may not be particularly advocating for, they may advocate for a particular position but they may not they may just provide a sort of broad advice and give a critique of, of kind of what's being suggested and point out the weaknesses and the strengths and maybe give some ideas I would always, you know, I always come with a position, to be honest, I always come with, I want this thing and I'm going to now <laughs> advocate for it. Um, and, you know, I think that's, I think policymakers know that's what I'm doing. It's, I'm not hiding that fact. And I think they know what they're doing when they, they engage with scientists. They're not expecting a kind of campaign of, of I want this thing. So mm -hmm. I'll leave it there. No, sure. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, thinking about the, the uh, I think it is interesting and important to think about the subtle differences and, and how things are perceived and and um, how it's important how things are communicated. Um, Alice, you were nodding along quite a lot there. I wonder if you wanted to add anything uh, following on from that. Uh, thank you, Hannah, and and thank you, Sarah. And yes, you you said pretty much what exactly what I was going to say as well. Uh, and and very much. I mean, if you think again, coming at this from a, a sort of a linguistic background if you think of the origin of the word advocate you're talking about pleading for it's a medieval word it's tied up in our legal traditions across Europe in terms of putting forward a case so that is very much your advocacy I have a position here whereas your advice is somebody approaching you as a as an expert in your field and you give a factual based uh, uh, perspective and you don't say whether you think you happen to think that that's the right perspective or the wrong perspective that is what the science says and you're advising in that regard whereas the advocacy is all about the words it's all about the emotion um, it's about pleading for a particular position um, in, in the true sense of the word so yes I, I completely uh, um, uh, agree with what, what Sari and what, what you've just said um, and I think there's quite a clear distinction between the two separate functions and one person can carry out both functions and can be approached by the same person on the other side of the debate for a response that covers both of the functions. Um, so it's a, a mixed skill set. Sure, yeah, definitely a, a challenging skill set to, to start developing and, and thinking about. Um, oh terrible with mute sorry um uh, do, you, do you want to follow up on that maybe anything that you observe from the interactions that go on with the policymakers and the uh, researchers that come through the the Mercator program well i have to say i'm actually fully in line with uh, what, what what allison and, and sarian said so there, there's uh, nothing new I, I can add about uh, the issue thank you no no worries um Lena, I'm, I'm going to throw it over to you, and I realise that we, we've really um, emphasised these points, so I'm going to um, add in a, another question for you to deal with if you do have a bit of input on this one. Um, we've had one through in the chat just to say um, whether you can elaborate maybe on some strategies for encouraging research to think of science policy as part of their work, like you mentioned earlier, um, which I think we, we all think is like an important factor to, to build into researchers' approach to how they perceive the impact of their work and the importance of what they, they engage with. Thank you, Hannah. Um, what works at the DSC is, is to say that, you know, wouldn't it be nice if not only your research was published, but it was actually also being used and helped to make the world a better place to be very <laughs> uh, on a very high level. Um, but it's really this that you can say, OK, the work that I'm doing is making a difference for other people and making society a better place, whether it's greener, whether it's safer, whether it's whatever it is. But that really that wouldn't it be nice that that the excellent work and the excellent science that you have developed will be used by others instead of being only hidden behind paywalls and nobody will make use of it. Yeah, that, that's a really good point because um, 
everyone feels that there's a lot of value to their research that they want to find new ways of, of um, getting across. So, And if, if you want to play a little bit with the carrot and the stick, you could also say that much of the research may be public funded money, so you have to give back. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can't just, uh, yeah, you have a responsibility to give back. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, Tom, do you, do you want to follow up on this one? Yes. Um... I mean, we, we made the, the experience that, that many of our uh, policy fellows that they ask uh, questions uh, which uh, have not yet arrived, arrived in, in uh, academic research. So they are actually policy, uh, some policy questions are, are far ahead of, of academic research. And, and we tell our researchers uh, that this is a great uh, way to identify future uh, research uh, topics by uh, talking to, to, to policy professionals. And uh, I can give some examples. Uh, um, for, uh, for example, we, we have fellows from, from the German Foreign Ministry and, and many of them interested in, in issues of uh, the impact of social media on international politics. Uh, we had uh, several fellows who were interested in uh, the uh, linkage between uh, gender and uh, digitalization. And we have experts on digitalization and gender, but actually no one is doing uh, both of it. So uh, by talking to policy professionals, uh, um, researchers can 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 uh, get a glance at uh, possible uh, research uh, uh, areas wonderful yeah i mean i I've, I've come across that point myself and also to think about um the importance of policy when you're starting a research project not only to identify the areas but also to think about how this is going to feed in at a later date rather than starting and then arriving with some research and saying well who wants this um yeah that's a really valuable point thank you um getting a bit conscious of the time actually um i'm sure i could carry on discussing this for such a long time and um really appreciate all of your um inputs on this um so i might just um come to you one last time for some some final thoughts um and maybe frame that in in a if you have a possible um example that you've come across in your experience of how um some policy engagement has translated into um something a change that you can see in your field or a difference or an uptake of a of of evidence into into policy making um that you could maybe share to give people an idea of the overall pathway um from start to finish or just a particularly important aspect of it that you've you've come across if that if that makes sense um perhaps if i come to lena first on this one if that's all right yeah sorry um i think is really coming back to what Thomas said that you start with the policy question. What is it that the, the policymakers? What is their question and not the research question? We, oh, I can't, you know, with COVID, you kind of lose the sense of time. So I can't exactly remember when uh, this year a report came out from the JSC on technology and democracy, and so a little bit on the same areas as Tom was saying. And uh, it was a joint research project done by the JSC and, and around 25 external researchers uh, looking into what are the implications of technology on democracy. Um, and this was a project that we co-developed with the Director General of Justice and Home Affairs in the Commission. And actually just today came out the press release on the new uh, initiatives on, uh, on, on democracy in terms of the, the, the challenges that we have with, with technology. And this, I think, was because from the beginning, we knew that there was a demand and throughout the project, it, there was uh, interaction with the policymakers. Uh, timelines were aligned, uh, so they had a short timeline, so we could only look into certain things, what was then most important for them. And it's not about losing your research integrity. It's about you have to make choices anyway of what you do your research on. I mean, it's, it's published, it's, it's reviewed and so on, so the methods are as, uh, as as strong as for any other research it's just about aligning in terms of needs and and timelines great thank you very interesting perspective thanks um Toma, yes go for it yeah, yes uh, I, I can give uh, an, another example uh, uh last year in uh, it was april uh, 2020 uh, we, we, i got a call from one of our alumni uh, policy fellows and uh, he told me that he was in a working group of, of the german government and he needed uh, academic expertise on the issue of uh, tracing apps and uh, so uh, we were able to put him in touch with uh, two experts on um, 
uh, cybersecurity and uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, phones and mobile devices, and, and he had the chance to to get uh, expertise the, the same day. And what and it, it also had some impact, but but I can't elaborate in public on that. But uh, what was really interesting, uh, this, this person had visited us in, in 2017, and uh, three years later, uh, he still remembered us and, and uh, the, the, the personal connections that were established uh, could then uh, be used uh, for the public good a couple of years later. That's a really great example. Interesting, this, the super short time frame, but really valuable to think about how building networks from the beginning comes back to, to uh, be a useful tool later on. Thank you. Um, Sarian, perhaps if it's all right to come to you next on this one. Yep, I will try and be quick, but I will try and give an example of how our science has influenced policy, but also the kind of policy for science angle as well, where we've had influence. So I think COVID is probably, you know, one example where we've, you know, our science has really changed the way we, you know, the UK, but also the world tackled the pandemic. And, you know, it, it would be easy to think that, you know, we did these proof principle studies a few years ago that showed that you can track disease this way. And then lo and behold, along comes a pandemic and boom, we're ready to go. But actually, it, you know, it doesn't work like that. And we spent a lot of time doing public, you know, doing engagement with policymakers about this. And actually in the weeks, I mean, it's quite gratifying, but in the kind of week in the run up to the first lockdown, we had... Um, Jeremy Hunt, who used to be the health minister in the UK, actually stood up in Parliament and asked, you know, you know asked the Prime Minister whether he was going to get a, get Sanger sequencing the, you know, COVID. And so to have, you know, someone as senior as that saying that is really proof of how that engagement, you know, put us on their radar. I think the other one where scientists really had a huge impact um, was on GDPR. And so in the UK, I actually wrote a consultation response that had been put out by the ministry that's responsible for data protection in the UK on the, the part of the GDPR that had been um, derogated to member states to write. And so this was about exemptions for research. And I wrote a consultation response on behalf of the sector and actually somewhat to my amazement, and I have to say this does not happen very often, um, DCMS, the, the government ministry, just accepted that in, in, you know, basically in total and wrote the legislation based on that consultation response. And those were scientists who had been inputting and saying, this is going to be the impact. If you do this, this is what we'd like to see. This is why we can do it responsibly. And it worked. And I, so I think scientists really can make a great difference. Um, and I'll... I'll be my end note. That's a brilliant end note. Yeah. Yeah, really gratifying to hear those things. Um, and I, yeah, I do wonder if, if COVID is leaving us with somewhat of a, an accelerated understanding of how important it is to have these things going on and for policymakers to engage and, and both ways. Um, Alice, if you don't mind being the one to uh, come in last on this. Absolutely. Thank you, Hannah. I think one thing I'll, I'll say is take a slightly different angle um, in terms of joining up. So when you're working on a piece of research, try and join up with other colleagues uh, uh, working on the same thing. Do it at a European level, because quite often, sometimes it's hard to achieve policy change at a national level. But if you're part of a European research project and you're targeting at a European level, it's actually easier to then get that policy change via the back door into your own country. So Europe is really helpful for national legislative change um, and policy change, not just European level uh, uh, policy change. Um, and, and it gives a greater strength, a greater weight to what you're advocating for, uh, uh, because you're speaking with a lot, uh, with greater data, uh, with different cultural uh, uh, perspectives to the same particular problem that you're working on. So I think uh, uh, ultimately, in terms of trying to influence policymakers, it is about a unity of voice, a unity of purpose, and absolutely the way you're telling your story. Um, I think those are the three key elements that I'd, I'd like to emphasise. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I think it, it leads back to the things that we've mentioned. And just to say, I mean, I'm stealing this from Lena, but that it's a team sport doing science advising. Um, wonderful. So we are, um, I think at the end of our session now, I, I just wanna really thank the panelists for engaging in the session and providing such an interesting conversation. And I hope that it's, it's the basis for starting further dialogue and, and really um, making those connections between um, scientists, researchers, policymakers, and, and everyone in between on that process. Um, just a quick thank you to um, 
to Chloe in the background for um, helping host this and planning and organising the event um, and for everyone else for attending and uh, really taking in an interest in the topic. I hope you've enjoyed the discussion um, found it interesting and informative. Um, and I think I will end the session here. Thank you to everyone. Um, and I wish you all uh, a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.